Hello and welcome to our program World Today. I'm your host Sharmeen Ali. Pakistani team, uh, a Pakistani team right now is present in Paris, led by Federal Minister for Economic Affairs Hamad Azhar to, uh, to present Pakistan's case to the Financial Action Task Force. Uh, apparently, the Financial Action Task Force is, at, at the moment, they've declared uh, Pakistan's moves satisfactory. The report has been deemed to be satisfactory, and there is a very low likelihood that Pakistan will be placed on the blacklist, according to the Finance Ministry. So that is a, a, some very good news coming from Paris, and uh, hopefully we'll find out the results of these presentations by our Pakistani team over the next three days when FATF reviews the entire report submitted by the Pakistani team in Paris. Uh, also, uh, we're entering, we have entered already the third month of a lockdown and a communications blackout in Indian-occupied Kashmir. It's the 72nd day of the lockdown in Indian-occupied Kashmir. Now, partial communications have been restored. Um, Post-paid post cellular services have been restored in occupied Kashmir. However, prepaid users are the majority in the valley, so most people are still out of any form of communication. Also, uh, recently in, an, in a demonstration in Sirinagar Valley, uh, 12 women have been arrested. They've been detained by Indian occupation forces. They were protesting against the illegal status change of uh, Indian occupied Kashmir. Out of these women, two of them were the sister and daughter of uh, former Chief Minister Farooq Abdullah, who is also detained since August 5th, since the revocation of Article uh, 250. The 270, and uh, also um, uh, his son Omar Abdullah has been under house arrest since that time, since August 5th. So a lot of uh, you know already protests have started. Women are being arrested and detained. There's still thousands of leaders and citizens still under arrest, and um, most of the people are still not uh, back to any sort of normalcy in their life. We'll be talking about that uh, on our program today. And also now, uh, one of the big news of today is that the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, Prince William and Catherine, Duchess of Cambridge, are in Pakistan. They arrived in Islamabad at Noor Khan Air Base last night. And today they went to visit uh, Islamabad Model School for Girls. And they also uh, went to visit the Margala Hills. They had a meeting with President Dr. Arif Alvi. And they also met with Prime Minister Imran Khan. And later on, they're expected to visit the Islamabad Monument, where they will have a small reception for them um, so they will be here for up until the 18th of the month and they'll be visiting the entire span of Pakistan from Gilgit Baltistan Lahore Islamabad they'll be visiting a lot of sites and meeting a lot of people over here and uh, the good news is also that Duchess uh, Kate Middleton was wearing the clothes of a Pakistani designer Maheen Khan which shows that Pakistani designers are now on the map internationally of world famous and world renowned designers. So let's begin our program and uh, welcome our guests who are present in the studio today. We have with us uh, Air Commodore Basit Raza, who is a senior analyst, and we also have with us Raja Faisal, who's a senior journalist. Thank you both for being on our program today. So, um, so let's begin with you today. Um, now, the FATF review going on this week, the Pakistani team that's there, I think they've done a phenomenal job in presenting our compliance report and the extent of which Pakistan has complied with the FATF uh, regulations. And it seems like Pakistan is not in any sort of dangerous area. What would you you say about that? Uh, as we are all aware, this uh, FATF is uh, watching two, two things, mm -hmm. anti-money laundering and um, um, financial uh, support to terrorism. So on these two accounts, because of uh, uh, some uh, drawbacks in our system, we were placed on financial their gray list. Uh, FATF is a body uh, created by G7 countries. Uh, to monitor these two uh, activities because it was felt that the uh, finances which are flowing to the terrorists, they are actually boosting their activities. And if this could be controlled, the uh, phenomenon of terrorism will be uh, also be curtailed and controlled. Right. So that's how it came into being. Unfortunately, the West has made terrorism synonymous with Islam. Mm. And when they said terrorism, their focus is on to the uh, Muslim countries and the activities. And as you know, there are only two countries in the world which are on the blacklist. One is Iran and the other is North Korea. Mm -hmm. So now Pakistan, when uh, it was placed on gray list, that is where we started moving. And since last uh, a year, a uh, lot of efforts have gone in. Mm -hmm. We have improved our legislation. We have improved our uh, uh, te technological uh, 
paraphernalia to detect uh, the uh, money laundering and those kind of activities. Yes. And we have also curbed the activities of those organizations which has been proscribed by UNO and uh, other agencies. Okay. So all these measures, there were actually 40 recommendations of FATF. Mm -hmm. And Pakistan uh, is compliant on uh, 36 of them. And on four, uh, we are non-compliant. Mm -hmm. This is the progress so far. But 36 of, out of 40 is significant. So we have made this progress and our team which is there, you know, uh, in August there was a meeting of Asia-Pacific Group, which actually looked into detail of all these uh, activities yes. and what the measures have been adopted in Pakistan and how effective they are. Mm -hmm. And based on their report, now it's the plenary session. This is the final session in which they will finally, uh, finally take a de make a declaration. In all likelihood, seeing that 36 out of 40 uh, recommendations have been implemented in Pakistan, some only some partially. Yeah. So Pakistan is likely to be, uh, uh, not likely to be placed on the blacklist. Mm -hmm. I'm very sure, and the news which is coming out from there, the unofficial ones, yes. also indicate in that direction. Mm -hmm. So, but for some times, Pakistan may remain on the gray list. And as you know, in the last meeting of the uh, Asia Pacific group after that, Pakistan was placed on uh, enhanced follow-up. So uh, previously we were required to make a presentation quarterly. Yeah. Now we are, uh, sorry, sorry biannually, bi after six months. Now we are required to make a presentation quarterly. Mm -hmm. So we'll be watched, but I'm sure uh, there's no problem and Pakistan's uh, efforts have been appreciated. Yes. And very vocally by three countries, China, Malaysia and Turkey and uh, other members also in general. Yes. Although behind the scenes, India has been trying to lobby that Pakistan should be placed on the blacklist, but indicators are that it's not going to be it's like that. It's not likely to happen. Yes. So Pakistan uh, has made right. progress and Pakistan has been successful in projecting its efforts and its effectiveness of these measures. Right. So to reiterate, the um, Asia-Pacific Group's uh, mutual, evalu mutual evaluation report issued earlier this month in October, they had said that uh, Pakistan, out of the 40 recommendations, showed full compliance in the financial institution secrecy law, number one. And on the remainder of the uh, different measures, it said that Pakistan was partially compliant on 26 and largely compliant on nine recommendations. So there's, uh, like Sir just mentioned, there are only four areas where Pakistan was not compliant. So this really shows that, and also the, these evaluations are up to the month of April 2018, and a lot of changes have gone on since then as well. So, uh, Raja Faisal. Well, I would start with that, you know, Pakistan, uh, I think it was very unfair of uh, FATF to put Pakistan in the gray list. Reason being Pakistan has been facing terrorism for a long time, more than, more than a decade. Pakistan faced active terrorism in Pakistan. And that too, just be because of uh, somebody else's war, we just took it to ourselves. And also state-sponsored yeah. terrorism by India. Exactly. And uh, of course, when uh, Pakistan was facing terrorism, then uh, there were uh, uh, you know, certain things Pakistan uh, could not comply with and uh, could not control within Pakistan. But Pakistan did try to do it at that time. And Pakistan lost uh, its huge uh, chunks of uh, its trade just because the investors were not uh, you know, interested in putting money in Pakistan. Why? Because they saw Pakistan being a country which is uh, badly hurt by uh, the terrorism and uh, it is of course uh, uncertainty which was uh, stopping them to put money in Pakistan. Investments were not coming into right, Pakistan. Exactly. But now when uh, in last five years Pakistan has uh, you know actively been fighting against the terror and uh, Pakistan uh, successfully uh, fought against the terrorism and Pakistan has secured itself from uh, the menace of terrorism, now uh, the world, especially FATF, should have been considerate enough towards Pakistan when it comes to putting Pakistan in a grey list. Why? Because they very well know that putting a country in a grey list makes a country uh, makes a country lose foreign investment. Reason being, the countries they want to put money in, they would always consider Pakistan's placement in the grey list. To me personally, uh, Pakistan has been, uh, you know, requesting FATF 
to bail them out of uh, the gray list. Gray list is, being in the gray list is not a good thing, you know. Blacklist is the worst, but of course when it comes to gray list, uh, Pakistan is losing and if it keeps on, uh, you know, uh, uh, staying in that gray list, of course it will lose in the coming, uh, uh, coming fiscal year as well, yeah. you know. So, uh, I believe somewhere down the line, FATF uh, was was not considered enough towards Pakistan. Pakistan need to get out of uh, this uh, grey list, and uh, Pakistan has done enough in the uh, in the previous year, and still Pakistan is doing. And I think Pakistan should be appreciated by FATF. Mm. Why? Because the progress they have made in this year. It's unprecedented, you know. In uh, previously, since we are in, uh, you know, FATF, Pakistan did try, but of course Pakistan could not do anything. Why? Because Pakistan was actively uh, having a war, war against the terrorism. And there were, uh, um, there were other things Pakistan was looking after at that time. Now, when Pakistan is doing everything, every possible thing it can do, then they should have been uh, considered enough. Yes, absolutely. And as you were saying, um, a lot of countries then look towards FATF's uh, recommendations and the greatest yeah. or blacklist, whether they should uh, invest in Pakistan or bring business here. Uh, FATF comprises of 37 members, which include the US, uh, the United Kingdom, China, India, and Turkey, also the Gulf Cooperation Council and the European Commission. Mm. Uh, basically, also all of your international organizations, True. the World Bank, IMF, all of them are going to be present there, the, the Asian Development Bank, all these large organizations which uh, bring in financing and investment to Pakistan. So that is also a big factor. They're going to be looking at what the review process is going on as well. And then further from that, we'll see uh, what their perception is going to be, which largely, um, you know, uh, the future investment and loans and all given here will be dependent on that, right, sir? Uh, very right. Because uh, being on grey list, uh, as my colleague has very rightly pointed out, uh, makes your uh, access to financial institutions and finances difficult. Yes. And more costly. I mean, and more risky more as risky. well for the institutions. That's right. Yeah. So there's a drawback. Mm -hmm. But this is the uh, unfortunate thing. This FATF, uh, in true sense, is more uh, an instrument of uh, the foreign policy uh, uh, dictates of uh, the G7 countries and the powerful countries of the world. Mm -hmm. This is how they keep the other countries aligned to their dictates. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you see 2017 and uh, up, uh, big early part of 2018, Pakistan was actually thrown into political wilderness. And that is the time when you are politically weak, we are on the back foot. Uh, that is the time Pakistan has been twice before placed on uh, 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 grey list. 2008 uh, after the atomic uh, uh, explosion and then again 2012 to 2015. So this is off and on we have been put on this list only because when we fell out of line with the uh, let's say the American interests or uh, another world power's interest. Uh, so this kind of punishment was meted out. Mm -hmm. This is the reality of the world unfortunate but this is how it is. But having said that whatever it is it's a system implemented in the world and we got to uh, abide by it. Yes. And what Pakistan has done, the concrete steps that they have taken now are showing the results. And uh, I don't think that we can get out of the gray list at the moment because only about uh, two months back we've been placed on the enhanced follow-up list. Mm -hmm. And But if we continue the trend and these four points which, which have remained uh, unactioned so far, we action them also. And the point, the 26 points, we are, we are only partially compliant. We have to show more progress on that. And I, I'm sure there's, there has been progress because the last meeting which, uh, which, which took place of where mutual evasion report, you very rightly pointed out, covered a period of last year. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the, the and changes... And only eight months had passed right. since the new government right. had uh, been right. inducted. And since then, a lot of water has passed under the bridges oh, yes. and a yeah. lot of improvements have actually uh, sunk in. Mm -hmm. The things which were, uh, uh, the legislation which had been passed ha are now being implemented. At that point, there were only legislation, no implementation. Yes. Now the implementation is also there. So all these things are categorically evidenced and they have been put up uh, in this plenary section which is in progress. And that's why I see that in all fairness, 
there will be no uh, 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 detrimental thing for Pakistan. The only thing is, as I just mentioned, that we may continue on the grey list, but definitely it will be recognized that the efforts made so far are taking us into the right direction yeah. and very soon we should be out of this. Yes, let's get into a bit of the efforts that have been made so far that we're talking about. Now, this is a complete overhaul of our financial systems and, you know, it takes time and our real estate system, everything has to be overhauled to make sure that uh, terror financing is not using these as a conduit to finance mm. uh, terrorist organizations. So, uh, so far, uh, the uh, Pakistan has first of all, created a set of regulations, like Sir was saying. And then after that, for uh, implementation, they have uh, the, the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission has helped financial institutions generate 219 suspicious transaction reports in just the last one year, yeah. compared to 13 in mm. the previous eight years, which we discussed earlier as well, yeah. which is significant. Uh, we've also... Um, uh, they've also conducted 167 inspections and they've given uh, further recommendations how to make improvements in the systems to these financial uh, institutions. And um, so there are a lot of things that are happening. And in order to comply in a system such as Pakistan's and then to make the uh, clients of these financial institutions and all to also comply, it's, it's a very difficult and long process. Mm. You know, uh, I would uh, start with the current government as soon as they took the office, the, the very uh, first thing they did was they were, everyone knew that they are anti-corruption and they would have a stance against uh, the corrupt mafias, existing political, be they political or uh, whichever they were. Uh, Pakistan took actions, started taking actions at that time and world recognizes that uh, Prime Minister's speech, UNGA speech, uh, speech it uh, was encircling all of the things which which uh, are part of uh, you know FATF demands mm -hmm. and Pakistan has done enough uh, in one year mm -hmm. whatever it was uh, you know of course there were 40 points and Pakistan couldn't be uh, you know in all of them uh, 40 points couldn't be compliant but um, at least Pakistan tried and Pakistan has uh, gone against corruption fully and uh, Pakistan is clamping down on uh, uh, money laundering. Uh, Pakistan ha has addressed the issues related to terror financing. Uh, Pakistan has revamped its banking system. Pakistan has introduced uh, the uh, uh, recommendations recommended by FATF to revamp Pakistan's uh, banking system and uh, Pakistan's channels, which were always used for uh, uh, money laundering, Pakistan has clamped down uh, on that as well. So now when Pakistan is doing what the world wants, when I say world, then you were very well uh, earlier talking about that, uh, you know, FATF, of course, it's the countries which are uh, most powerful countries and uh, they are the ones who are uh, controlling uh, the foreign policy of the world. And of course, whatever Pakistan is facing, it has a lot to do uh, due to its uh, foreign policy preferences. And uh, I believe they need to think about it. Uh, you can, you know, if you want to clap, you need two hands for it. Right. Pakistan is extending its hand by trying its level best to comply with uh, everything they are being suggested by FATF. Now it's ball uh, in, the, in the court of FATF to make Pakistan feel that they want uh, the same uh, from Pakistan and they want to do the same from themselves as well. You know, mm -hmm. if they want to have uh, a melodious clap, then of course they have to extend their hand as well to Pakistan. Right, absolutely. And uh, I think... Uh, uh, anything can be better if they help Pakistan. And 
I, I, I personally believe that Pakistan should come out of the grey list, yeah. but I believe they would be keeping Pakistan. And it's in everybody's favour that it exactly. should. And uh, so now we're going to talk about the situation uh, with Kashmir. Um, the Indian Foreign uh, Indian Defence Minister Rajnath Singh made some very volatile comments a couple of days back. He said that um, you divided India into two pieces as part of the two-nation theory in 1947. Uh, he was quoted uh, as saying by India Today. But in 1970, one, your country was divided into two pieces again, and if the situation persists, then no power can stop Pakistan from being broken up further. Now, this is a highly um, conf uh, conflagratory uh, statement, and the Foreign Office has given its response today. Uh, the Foreign Office has said that it is highly responsible of the Indian Defence Minister to be threatening the splitting of a sovereign country. We are sure that the world community would take cognizance. For his part, Mr. Rajnath Singh should have no doubt that the security forces and people of Pakistan remain ready to resolutely defend the country against any evil design. This was a very necessary uh, response and a very befitting response to the Indian Defense Minister's statement. Who's, uh, he's made several statements like this in the past as well. So uh, he's been known to say these kind of things uh, previously and he's the one who also uh, went back on saying on his comments on the no first use policy regarding nuclear weapons as well. And uh, Pakistan had earlier denounced his, these statements as well as irresponsible and that Pakistan vowed to maintain credible minimum deterrence, uh, a credible minimum deterrence position uh, in this issue also. So, uh, sir, would you like to comment on uh, this ongoing uh, uh, spate of statements by the Indian Defense Minister? How irresponsible is this for a defense minister to be speaking this way in a very, very tense situation between two countries? And uh, the world should see that there's belligerence coming from one side and on the other side, you have a prime minister who's perpetually talking about making peace and having dialogue. Uh, I think in every uh, political system, there are hardliners. But uh, like uh, we had in America, John Bolton was a hardliner. I mean, he won't listen to the president. Uh, but if you look at India, you feel that there are only hardliners. There is no, no one else. Starting from the prime minister right down to their even Sikh member, uh, this uh, Harsimrat Kaur Badal, they are all uh, very uh, inflammatory statements they pass on. And... Uh, Actually, uh, nothing succeeds like success. The re victory in the last election, they rode on the waves of anti-Pakistan uh, move that they, they started. Despite having uh, uh, suffered in, during that Bala court incursion, uh, still they uh, created a propaganda anti-Pakistan and their war mong mongering. And all their lies and all their this uh, thing that they had created actually helped them. And they won the uh, a resounding victory in that election. So that has emboldened them. So they are one after another. And now you see, even if the last few days, they, uh, this, uh, they revoked the uh, Article 370 uh, of their constitution. They uh, um, uh, made those um, um, Assam, uh, Muslims in Assam, they made them stateless. And uh, next, I think uh, they are planning to, uh, after the Supreme Court verdict on the Babri Masjid is going to be out next month. And they are going to, I think, uh, create Ram Mandir. They are all prepared for that. Exactly. So they have, they have lit a fire. And they have to keep stoking it mm. by any means. And Rajnath has just done that. And uh, Ajit Doval would fire a salvo tomorrow. Mm. And no, Modi is no less. And I will remind you that he has talked of dismembering Pakistan, uh, this uh, separation of uh, East Pakistan and uh, Bangladesh coming into existence. But Modi has very categorically admitted that they were behind it. Mm. He did it in Dhaka when he was visiting there. Unfortunately, the world is not taking notice of all this. Exactly. Because the America, the Indian uh, economic, uh, uh, the, the kitty that they have, the world has their eyes on that. Absolutely. And their actions, yeah. they untoward these uh, absolutely uh, inhuman and uh, inflammatory statements. Nobody noticed that. And, and they're winning elections based on exactly. hatred towards Muslims, exactly. towards Pakistanis. The Foreign Office say, has also said that the BJP should contest elections on the basis of its own performance rather than dragging Pakistan into the domestic political foray for electoral gains. And this is mm. very apt. This is very correct because once they start using this uh, hatred, hatred angle to win elections, then they have to follow through. And then they have to act belligerent in order to show that they mean what they say. And that's one of the reasons why they continue continue with these statements and they continue with their acts of aggression. Mm. Uh, you know, 
I will start with that uh, today's India, I won't say that it, it's Hindu India, I won't say it's a Muslim India, or I won't say it's a secular India. It's a Hinditwa India, which is actually following the Hindutva uh, you know, mindset. Uh, the dis the pr premier display was given uh, almost 10 days ago when they were handed over uh, Raphael, and they started uh, the puja of uh, uh, the Raphael, and it is being, you know, criticized in India as well by the Hindus themselves. I mean, they are saying we are a secular country. The secular Hindus, they are saying that we are a secular country. Mm. What about the Muslim minority? What about the Christians, Sikh minority? Right. Are they allowed to do their uh, pujas as well? Are they allowed to pray for their own uh, thing as well with the Raphael? Or is just the uh, uh, Hindutva which is allowed to do it? So, number one, today's India has changed itself. Mm. What I see that uh, today's India is same like uh, uh, Pakistan of 80s, when uh, Pakistan had changed itself, like, you know, Pakistan, uh, uh, due to uh, the Soviets in our neighbors, uh, there were uh, changes in the so uh, society of Pakistan. And Pakistan has, you know, gone out of that phase, and Pakistan has, uh, you know, it was very hard for Pakistan to get out of that phase. Yes. And Pakistan has successfully came out of it. But now, India is in the same uh, place where Pakistan was in the 80s. And today's India is seeing that the majority of uh, their countrymen, they are extremists. They are not, uh, uh, you know, peaceful to each other. Uh, Muslims are being uh, dragged, lynched, slaughtered on the streets of India. Sikhs are being lynched in the streets of India. Christians are being lynched and burnt. You know, last week one of the, one of the Christians was uh, burnt in India. So the world is watching that. Mm -hmm. Today's India is not secular India, it's And it's Hindutva not that image India. of that incredible India campaign they exactly. had going, where it was a region of peace and yoga and this and that. And now it's, it's looking like a scary place. Exactly. And talking about economy, their economy is already seeing a downshift, you know. It's going uh, nosedive, mm. you know. Why? Because the world is watching it. Okay, and so you're, you're talking about the world is watching this. Now, what I would like to ask you is this, uh, that, okay, we've seen a lot of articles in the print media, by the international media, such as Washington, uh, uh, the New York Times especially, has reported a lot on, on this issue and the human rights violations. So that's the print media. But we're not seeing a lot on the television channels. They're focusing more on the riots in Hong Kong. Uh, Prime Minister Imran Khan tweeted about that as well. So what is the reason why the international television channels are not showing all these things that Rajasab just mentioned, people being burned on the streets and all this terrible violence taking place. This is unprecedented. This does not happen in a civilized country anywhere in the world in history. Uh, it, you cannot call it a secular democracy. You cannot call it civilized from anywhere. Uh, there are two reasons. One, I have just um, uh, spoken out that the India's economic might, uh, when Modi goes out to France, he has an order of 100 aircraft in his pocket and the same order is in his pocket when he goes to states. And both the leaders are looking at that order of 100 aircraft, and each one wants that it should be given to us. So this is one reason that uh, they have greater purchasing power, and they are a bigger, bigger economic commodity, and that is why the world is uh, sort of trying to lure them, and uh, overlooking whatever wrong things they are doing. The second reason is that uh, Every country uh, has its own uh, axe to grind, if I may say. They have their own problems. Like if you open BBC, they will the top news will be Brexit. And they'll keep on uh, looking at it from various angles, and other news will be sidelined. If you open up CNN, then it will be the Hong Kong, the trouble in the Hong Kong. So in these two events, and now this, this, uh, the Kurdish, uh, this uh, Turkish uh, invasion exactly. of Syria, that is uh, uh, catching the limelight. Top so, news. Under these, mm -hmm. the issue of Kashmir yeah, exactly. is actually uh, uh, being marginal, pushed onto the, the sideline, back burner, thing. that's yes. right. So it's unfortunate, the vested interests of the powerful countries, uh, their economic interest, plus this particular phenomena, that's actually giving them, the Indians, more space to do whatever they want to do. Mm -hmm. And they have been doing it. Now 77 days have passed 
that the Kashmiris have locked down in their homes and the world is just watching yes. and doing nothing about it. And, doing and the media coverage that you have talked has only highlighted the violation of human rights to some, some extent. Mm -hmm. They have not condemned the basic act which is the revocation of Article 370. Yeah. That is the basic crime which is committed there. Yeah. Uh, something which you have promised, your leadership promised to the world. At UNO, at every level, you have promised that this is what we are going to do. And uh, one day you just wake up and say that, no, we are not going to do it. And the world is just not bothered about it. Yeah, exactly. Despite the noise we have generated, we have uh, knocked at every door. We have gone to Security Council. We have gone into the Human Rights Council. We have met heads of states and did everything. We have, in fact, uh, as Prime Minister said that I am the ambassador of uh, 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 Kashmir. And he is playing that part very well. Yeah. But what is make, going to make a change is that Pakistan has to play a more prominent role in the international affairs, like the present uh, yeah. mission that he has taken, mm -hmm. patching up between uh, facilitating the uh, dialogue between Iran and um, Saudi Arabia, our efforts at um, 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 uh, boosting up the Afghanistan peace process. These are the things which will push our case forward and give us the space to project our point of view and get the way uh, sort of the steer into our direction, the direction that we want them to take. Right. So okay. this is what Pakistan must do it. And in that, it's not only the government which will do. Every nation, each one of us is responsible for that. Our diaspora in America and Britain and other countries, the, we are all responsible for that. We have to play this part and sort of uh, tell the world what is the actual picture of Kashmir? Mm -hmm. And we are the only ones who can do it. No one else will right. do it. And even that now, I feel that the Kashmiri diaspora has also become quite active in the United States, especially they went and spoke to Congress and all and uh, spoke about their relatives' mm -hmm. condition and their situation. So sure. I think Prime Minister Imran Khan has been very instrumental in sort of mobilizing all the diaspora, whether it's Pakistanis or Kashmiri uh, Americans or uh, everywhere in the world. People are now becoming vocal and going out and speaking to elected representatives and complaining about what's going on there. And that is why you're getting this response from the congressmen and senators, etc. So now that you have um, uh, the situation where the maybe the partial lockdown, they're saying that they've restored some communication. So now we've seen a protest. We've seen a protest with women. And the women, are uh, they were protesting. The placards were about human rights uh, violations. And it was also about the change of status in Indian-occupied Kashmir. So now the Indian authorities did not hesitate to go and arrest 12 women and detain them. Two of them are the sister and daughter of Farooq Abdullah, who was a, pr a previous uh, chief minister of Indian-occupied Kashmir. His son is also under house arrest. So, I mean, the, the Indian authorities don't even look at whether these are women. I mean, how much harm are women going to do to you? They're not carrying weapons. They're completely unarmed. This is a peaceful protest. So, uh, they're allowed to just arrest people who are protesting peacefully? Well, right now, Kashmir is lawless. I mean, uh, there is an occupational force of 900,000 uh, active troops mm -hmm. of Indian Army, and they are actively you know, uh, in Kashmir, and uh, this is what they are there for, you know. They have occupied Kashmir, and uh, they have abrog abrogated uh, Article 370. And I want to add something here. You know, Kashmiris are voicing, Pakistanis are voicing, people throughout the world, Pakistanis or Kashmiris, they are voicing against uh, this abrogation of Article 370 and illegal annexation by India of Kashmir. But now there is an in inclusion to it. A uh, few of the same voices from the Congress party of India, they have actually condemned it and they have said that we want to uh, take it back to what it was uh, before the abrogation of three, Article 370. And guess what? Uh, Modi, he, in one of the uh, public uh, gatherings, he has challenged his oppo opposition. See, this is the level of uh, his jingo jingoistic thought, and he's up to for something which can be considered as uh, jingoism. He is openly challenging them that if you, if you have, if you are daring enough, come forward and, uh, you know, restore Article 370. Yeah, okay. See, so this is the level going on right now in India. Yes. And even the Indian sane voices, 
there are few sane voices. They are looking at it as well. Why? Because they can see that in coming future, there would be problems for India. Yes. As soon as they lift the curfew, you know, they lift the curfew fully, then of course it would be uh, open to the, throughout the world that this is what has gone wrong in Kashmir. And Absolutely. there would be there would be a reaction of that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Hopefully saner voices will prevail. Exactly. And now we're coming to the royal visit to Pakistan by the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge who arrived in Islamabad at Noor Khan Air Base uh, yesterday evening. Um, the, that was yesterday evening at around 9.30, 10 o'clock they arrived in Islamabad. And today since morning they've been engaged in official engagements going and visiting a local school, Islamabad uh, Model College for Girls, where they met little students and uh, a lot of uh, activity and interaction action with the teachers over there as well. So they wanted to see the conditions of the education system in Pakistan. They want to know more about the people of Pakistan and they want to see more of the country as well. They also uh, went to see uh, trail number five on the Margala Hills to uh, see how the environmental protection measures are going on in the country as well. And they also met with the uh, president, Dr. Arif Alvi and his wife, and they also met with uh, Prime Minister Imran Khan at the PM House. So the security personnel from the United Kingdom with the assistance of local forces, paramilitary troops, uh, troops and police are providing the security to the visiting royal couple during their stay in Pakistan. And an advanced security team from the United Kingdom comprising over half a dozen personnel have arrived in the capital and reviewed the security arrangements uh, for the Duke and Duchess. Uh, besides security officials from the British High Commission in Islamabad, they also strengthened the couple security further. Contingents of the Army, Rangers and Fr Frontier Constabulary are also taking part in the VVIP security for the visiting uh, royal couple during their movements in the city. VVIP routes will be put in place to ensure smooth flow of their cavalcade and ensure security. The members of the British royal family will also be provided box security and arrangements were made for their stay in the heavily guarded diplomatic enclave. Um, that's what the official sources have said. The Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, uh, Prince William and Duchess Catherine met the Prime Minister today and they also met the President, uh, Dr. Arif Alvi today. Uh, the Duchess of Cambridge uh, was wearing a blue designer jora by Pakistani uh, designer outfit, actually we'd call it, by Pakistani designer Maheen Khan. And the second outfit that she wore when she met the Prime Minister, uh, the top that she wore was uh, by a renowned uh, British designer and the pants were also by Maheen Khan and the dupatta was also by Pakistani designer Satrangi. So she's mixing up and matching up her outfits and wearing a lot of the local designs and um, the local dresses, traditional dresses, that was her wish. And she's also been seen to honor a lot of what uh, Princess Diana wore on her previous trip to Pakistan in 1996. She's matching the colors up with what Princess Diana wore when she arrived in her pale blue, blue dress. That was also similar to what Princess Diana wore and she's wearing green like Princess Diana wore. And uh, a lot of it is very similar to the dresses of Princess Diana. And because the people of Pakistan keep Princess Diana very close to their hearts. And uh, of course, she's Prince William's mother, his late mother. Um, the couple will also be uh, attending uh, an event at the National Monument later on today. And they visited a school earlier today and uh, they visited a trail in the Margala Hills and they met the President and the Prime Minister of Pakistan and they will continue their trip over the next couple of days to see the entire length of Pakistan from Gilgit Baltistan, Lahore, uh, of course the capital Islamabad where they're present right now and they are very keen on meeting the people of Pakistan and getting to know them better. So hopefully they'll have a wonderful stay while they're here and uh, at the moment uh, Pakistan has uh, welcomed them with open arms and there's been a lot of excitement and jubilation seeing the royal couple here in Islamabad. So that brings us to the end of our program today. Unfortunately, that's all the time that we have. I'd like to uh, thank our guests who are with us in the studios today. Raja Faisal, thank you again for joining us. Air Commodore Basit Raza, thank you for your insights on all the issues that we talked about. And thank you for joining us on today's program. We'll see you next time on World Today. Bye-bye from me and our team.